Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Diane Gayhart, and in this lecture I'm going to talk about collaborative therapy, a postmodern approach, and the related approach of ref reflecting teams. This lecture is designed to accompany my textbooks Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy, Theory and Treatment Planning in Counseling and Psychotherapy, as well as Theory and Treatment Planning in Family Therapy. All of these are available through Sengage.com. So we're going to begin by talking about collaborative therapy. So um, collaborative therapy is an approach that's often difficult to first get a handle on because there are not a lot of really concrete techniques. It's very much based on the therapist ability to embody social constructionist ways of knowing and ways of being, ways of being in relationship. And so it's much more of a philosophy and a process that's being facilitated than it is, you know, kind of cookbook test um, type techniques. So the process they're trying to create is this two-way dialogical conversation. And what does that mean exactly? It's when the therapist and the client engage in a process in which both parties are able to share their inner dialogues, but at the same time really take in and reflect on in a very kind of non-defensive way the other person's perspective or a non-judgmental way is probably a better way to say it. Um, the other person's ex um, understandings. And as there's this two-way exchange, or if there are more people, there could be a three, four, five, six-way exchange, as all of these ideas and perspectives are allowed to kind of coexist in the room without um, the therapist kind of privileging one or the other, there's this very transformational process that occurs where new meanings and new understandings um, kind of naturally emerge from this process. And what is so I think powerful in this process is that whatever understandings about the problem that come, the new understandings, they very much um, make sense to the client because they're built upon the client's understanding and worldview to begin with. And so it feels very natural, it feels very um, effortless almost for the clients to embrace these new perspectives and you can contrast that to an approach such as more traditional cognitive behavioral approaches where the therapist kind of comes in and offers the client this, you know, kind of uh, other way of looking at things. It's based on science and research but not necessarily the client's internal worldview and the way the client makes sense of things. And so there's really more of a, an, and that type of approach, or even a systemic family of therapy approach, there's a reframe that the therapist offers that they try to, you know, make fit with the client's worldview. But in many ways, this is a much, much more subtle process, and it's much more organic, and it comes much more organically from within the client's perspective. And so when the new um, perspectives and ideas arise, they, they make perfect sense to the client. And I think that's, um, I think, one of the real strengths of this particular approach. And it's very much about a particular type of process. There's no specific technique or cookbook recipe you're going to use in collaborative therapy, but it's very much about the therapist embodying this approach. So it's not one you're going to read the book and you're going to do a role play and it's all going to, yeah, you're going to get it like that. Or you can even kind of, it's much more of the therapist, I feel like, needs to almost be trained in an environment, spend time in an environment where people think and live and work and relate and talk this way, um, where it begins to really make sense. And so, uh, just another key area here, or concept here, is that the therapist is trying to promote the client's sense of agency. Um, so the therapist is not in control of necessarily the meanings that are being uh, developed or the interpretations of life, um, but rather uh, putting those things out there and doing it in such a way and through a process where the client develops a sense of agency where many clients come in feel, feeling very powerless in their situation. And so um, one of the main outcomes of this two-way dialogical co-creation of meaning is that the client regains a sense of agency of being the main actor who's uh, in their own life. So the two significant contributions to the field. So you'll hear a lot um, within the field, uh, many, many therapists claim to be collaborative in a more generic way, but when postmodern collaborative therapists talk about being collaborative, one of the key concepts that comes from this approach is this idea of what they call not knowing or knowing with. And I know collaborative therapists get mocked and made fun of a lot, you know, about not knowing and even direct, I don't know, criticized, you know, people are paying you to know, how can you not know, how is that helpful? 
And the, the idea of not knowing does not mean the therapist forgets everything they ever learned in grad school or studying for their licensing exam. It's really more about not assuming, okay, and avoiding pre-knowing. And it's a strange um, kind of catch-22 we have as therapists is that, you know, we're, we go get master's degrees, doctoral degrees to do what we do, which involves mastering a lot of knowledge. But um, also, as you master knowledge, and there is some research to support this about the more a, a sen senior a therapist or seasoned a therapist is, that they actually, the more they assume, and there's a lot more that they miss. And sometimes they actually uh, miss very important things because they assume they know everything. So when you hear a client coming in, so, so let's say a first-year therapist is out there, and a client comes in and describing symptoms um, that... Uh, maybe consistent with, let's even just say something as generic as a major depression, okay? So a newer therapist is going to be a lot more curious usually about, um, you know, what's going on for the client, how they experience their depression, because they're still trying to figure out, you know, maybe even distinguish it between certain types of anxiety versus depression versus bipolar. Um, whereas a more seasoned clinician is likely to um, hear a couple of symptoms and just assume that they, they know that they've seen so many people with this profile, you know? Um, and, but it's very possible they might miss, um, miss things. Um, for example, I had a case come in recently where the, it was, I guess she was 14 when I met her, a textbook symptoms right out of the book, bipolar. Um, the one thing that was interesting to me, though, there wasn't a lot of content to it. And so, but her parents were absolutely uh, very dead set, no medication. So I worked with her and we, for a year and a half, and we actually got her very stabilized um, without medications, you know, until it was the summer of her junior year, and she was an honor student, you know, practicing, you know, in the theater and music, and she just did, was super high achiever. But within six, eight weeks of her junior year, all of a sudden she was so depressed she couldn't get out of bed. Um, it got so bad, finally the parents agreed. We sent her to a psychiatrist who's like, of course it's bipolar. Uh, textbook case, gave her the bipolar meds, and she um, couldn't take them because of the side effects within two to four weeks. But she also had uh, zero symptom relief. And so then um, he agreed to give her the um, antidepressants, but he's like, you know, she may have a manic episode if we do this, but at this point she was on a disability leave from school because she was so bad. So the parents agreed to that, and they put her on that medication, and four weeks later, still no symptom relief. And I'm like, God, you know what? This, um, this is really weird. And it's also really weird that she still doesn't have any content to this, like, debilitating depression. And I sent, I uh, asked her mother, I said, do you ever go to that, um, functional medicine? I have a, um, functional medicine is a newer branch of medicine that's very wellness oriented where they actually pull lots of blood to see if you um, if your organs are functioning properly. They also tend to do a lot of allergy testing. So she hadn't, um, so they went and took her. I guess long story short, they came back that she had um, gluten intolerance and a, a congenital liver defect where her body wasn't absorbing the vitamins. And so they put her on like 22 different supplements. I mean, these are vitamins, omega-3s, B, she had to give herself B shots. But when, within two weeks, all of her bipolar, classic textbook bipolar symptoms were gone. And she's been stable now for six or eight months. So again, it's this, you know, being curious. And it's, you know, I remember talking to the, doc, the psychiatrist. He's like, oh, this is, this is just textbook, you know, bipolar. I've seen it a million times. She's, she'll just respond. She's just slow to respond. So there's, you know, being curious, being open, avoiding assumptions. Um, it is, it's a discipline. It's actually very hard to do because when we hear people's story, stories, we want to, you know, we kind of just naturally fill in the blanks with our own reality and our own beliefs and our own experience. And once you become a therapist, now you've got the experience, the more seasoned you get, you've got thousands of other stories to like fill in someone's story with. And it takes a lot of discipline, especially the more you practice, to not make assumptions, to be tentative, to continually be curious. Um, and, and so when you hear someone's lost their mother, you know, you don't want to fill in all of your assumptions about what that was like for you or, you know, could be like, or what you imagine it's going to be like for you. You just, so, you know, what is it about the loss of your mother that has the most meaning, that brings you the most sadness, you know? And someone says you're depressed. How do you, 
what's your depression like? You know, what's it, what are you like in the morning? What type of things do you think about? What things do you do? So it's like no depression, no anxiety, no marital conflict, no response to an affair is the same for anybody. And so you're just intensely curious because you know that this person has totally unique meanings uh, of what the affair might have meant for them and totally unique experience of anxiety or depression or whatever it is. It's, and so there's this very much uh, recognition of the how meaning gets created, especially around our problems, is entirely unique and you just want to, to understand um, really uh, that unique client's pers unique meanings that they're giving and avoid um, assuming and putting your own meanings on their situation. Rumor has it people and their stories. So um, most of what is considered collaborative therapy um, was developed by Harlene Anderson and Harry Galushin, who uh, established the Houston Galveston Institute down in Texas. And they developed their ideas, um, first working kind of systemically, um, but as they worked with multi-problem families in a psych psychiatric uh, unit in, um, I think they, they began in Galveston, um, they began to listen differently and they were influenced by these newer postmodern ideas that came out and they evolved this approach. Tom Anderson, please note that there is a spelling difference and Tom and Harleen are not re related but they were really best friends in many, many ways. Tom is from Norway and he came to these, developed these ideas um, by visiting, he was visiting the Milan team and who was practicing in a very tr uh, traditional systemic way where what they actually did back in those days is that the team would be in one room behind a one-way mirror and the family and the conductor or therapist of the session is in another and they actually switched the lights on and off. <laughs> um, okay, that's so in, in Milan they would actually, you know, the team would watch, the, the conductor or the therapist would come out and they'd go back in the room. So when Tom went to go set this up, Back in Norway, he had the idea of actually having the family switch the, switching the lights in the two rooms so the family could hear what the team was actually saying. So this is how it, the practice evolved, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, but he worked very closely with Harleen and Harry, um, taking postmodern ideas, specifically the um, social construction ideas and putting them into action. Lynn Hoffman, who actually began um, as an editor for... Uh, Virginia Satir, who also studied with um, Mnuchin and Jay Haley, and did writing for both, at least for Haley, I believe. Um, she also ended up working with the Milan team. And from her connection to the Milan team, she also ended up working with uh, Harleen and Harry and Tom Anderson, uh, and kind of evolved into this collaborative social constructionist way of approaching meaning. Similarly, Peggy Penn, who uh, was at the Ackerman Institute, and she also was very involved with the Milan team, evolved into a more collaborative way. And I guess that's a Gianfranco Cicchin, who was one of the founders of the Milan team, also in his later years uh, practiced much more in a, this collaborative therapy sort of way. Jaco Sekula we'll talk more about, and he has developed um, an approach called Open Dialogue in Finland that is used to um, work with clients having uh, psychiatric episodes, and he has just had phenomenal um, results, and in fact, um, probably one of the most effective treatments um, so far for uh, psychosis and schizophrenia. And most of the work is associated with uh, the Houston Galveston Institute. The Big Picture Overview of Treatment. So, in some sense, the um, overview of treatment, the process of treatment, is very, very simple. And in collaborative therapy, it's basically keep a two-way dialogue going, and that's it. There's no stages necessarily of change or anything complex like that. So as long as there is a two-way dialogue and exchange, uh, the therapist trusts that um, new meanings will evolve, that will um, you know help the client resolve the issue in whatever way it needs to be. Sometimes the resolution is, oh, the client sees it differently. They maybe aren't personalizing an attack from their partner anymore. Um, or maybe they see, they're like, ah, oh, if it's that, these new meanings enable me to take this type of new action. So that is, um, that's the, the essence. So what you're, the main thing you're not doing, um, I think Harry Galushin was very, very 
a wise words when he said, you know, it's much easier for me to tell you what not to do in therapy than it is to tell, tell you what to do. And it's more important that you don't do these things than you do exactly things in a certain way. So what you don't want to have happen is have the dialogue break down into dueling monologues, so to speak. So where each person's trying to convince the other of their perspective. Obviously, when couples and families come in, that's usually where their communication has broken down. They have dueling monologues. Where it should be this way, not that way. You know, we should be doing this, not that. Um, you should be doing this, not that. And so the worst thing you want to have happen, and I think this is true of any approach, is to have it break down into the therapist telling the client that you got to do this. Meanwhile, the therapist is trying to convince, you know, the client's trying to convince the therapist of something else. And so the other way of thinking about this, when this happens, a monologue creates a therapeutic impasse in that the conversation is no longer generating useful meanings or understandings. And so the therapist's primary job primary job is to just make sure that people, and one very, it's not the word I know that any collaborative person might use, but maybe it's helpful when you're trying to understand this for the first time, that you don't want anyone to get into a defensive position, because that's kind of what a monologue is. My truth is the reality. Because once someone gets really stuck in trying to convince someone else of their position, they're not taking in any new information. And if they're not taking in new information, nothing is going to change. Even if you're quote-unquote right and you have a ton of research to back you up, nothing's going to change. And so the therapist does not get into this, well, I'm right, I've got whatever, more experience or more knowledge or more research behind what I'm saying, and I'm just going to convince the client how to do it. Um, if you have ever tried to do this you'll with either a client or another human being, usually someone in your family or friend, it, it really works. And so that's why the jo therapist's job is just keep that two-way uh, communication and exploration of ideas going. And if it breaks down, it's the therapist's job to go back and, you know, open up that two-way dialogue. So now let's talk a little bit more about the specific elements of the therapeutic relationship and collaborative therapy. So in many ways, much of this approach is the therapeutic relationship. And the primary element, uh, aspect of this approach is the philosophic stance of the, and the belief that we human beings um, construct meaning through relationship and through dialogue. So that's basically the social constructionist assumptions. And so they think of themselves as conversational partners. Uh, creating a, a type of dialogue, uh, a kind of meaning-making, dialogic, two-way conversation that's going to produce new knowledge. And there's a sense of witness in kind of exploring um, the client's pers perspective and concerns and possibilities together. There's a sense of being with the other person. Um, and there really is an art of curiosity and not knowing. And you'll hear these terms bounced around a lot. And it sounds like you know what they mean initially, but it's a very specific type of postmodern curiosity and this ability to um, really put aside all of the all of our assumptions um, and meanings that we have and like I said before it is a it's a very intense discipline to do this and the more you practice this the more you realize how much we ha we do this automatically and this is somewhat what culture is culture is a whole bunch of assumptions that we all share and we kind of fill in the blanks so that we can coordinate meaning we can coordinate our actions we cannot run over each other at intersections and so that default natural socialized um, life skill, it's a social skill to kind of fill in some of these blanks. You have to undo that when you're working from this approach. So just when someone says that they're depressed, you want, you have, to, to a collaborative therapist, when someone client comes in and says, I'm depressed, that means nothing to a collaborative therapist practically. It's like, when and how do you experience it? What is it like for you? What is, you know, so you get very, very curious about the real nuances and, and specificities of that particular client's experience. Um, and so it's the ability to not know, but of course there are going to be times where the therapist brings in his or her own expertise. And I often think of it as like, okay, I've got this huge bookshelf of knowledge, professional knowledge in my head. And so, but it's on the shelf when I'm, you know, talking with a client. And first I want to start by understanding life within their reality and how they're making sense of things, how they interpret things, what thing, what's important, what's not important in this, how do they put all the pieces of their life together? And as they're talking, I might turn to this bookshelf and I might say, hey, you know what? 
you know, there's a, there's somebody, you know, there's a therapist who thinks this. What do you think about that? Oh, there was a study that found this to be the case for certain people. Does that do with your reality? Would any of this in professional information be helpful to you? Oh, yes. Well, let's read further. Oh, no. Let's put it back on the shelf. I don't care. You know, I'm not, there's a point where we don't get attached to it all. You know, for example, I love, I'm, I'm very much believe in mindfulness. I think it's an amazing approach. It can be very, very helpful to a lot of people. But I'm realistic. It is not for most people. And so even though the research may be phenomenal on how, you know, mindfulness might help my client, I, I might say, hey, you know, have you ever, there's this practice called mindfulness, and this is, you know, some of the research and kind of what the basic, any interest for you? Or is this something, you know, the client says, there's no way in the world I'm ever going to sit down and watch myself breathe for two minutes a day. I'm like, fine, that's great. We're going to move on to something else. And, and so that's where there's, so the client has the expertise in their world, and I have my own professional knowledge and expertise, but my real expertise is creating a conversation that shifts meaning for clients and opens new possibilities. Um, these are uh, collaborative therapists off, uh, really try to use everyday ordinary language and avoid um, jargon and introducing clients to jargon. They prefer to, if the client says, I feel blue rather than depressed, then that's what we're going to call it, feeling blue. Um, and the other idea, too, in here is that there's inner and outer talk and that both the client and the therapist have inner dialogues going on as well as the outer dialogue that we're hearing that's going on between us. And obviously with more people, there are more dialogues. But you make space for all those, and you honor and allow time for that inner dialogue. And you also attend to your own inner dialogue because it can give you lots of important information. And so even if, you know, whatever the therapist's inner dialogue is, is also something the therapist is monitoring. And there are times where you'll say out loud what it is. We'll talk more about being public. And there are times um, where you use that information to just, you know, facilitate the conversation in some way. So we're going to move on to talking uh, some about case conceptualization in collaborative therapy. So case conceptualization um, is very much constructed around the postmodern social constructionist uh, worldview. So the earlier uh, way that Harleen and Harry kind of transitioned from systemic ideas to postmodern is they talked about the problem organizing, problem dissolving system. Not so much a term that they use today, but it's kind of interesting and I think it's worth just mentioning it. Because um, instead of talking about the family system, they started talking about the problem organizing system. So that's not just, so the question is, who is talking about the problem? And that's who needs to be in therapy or involved in the therapy conversation because they're the ones who are helping shape the meaning um, of what the problem is and that all those, those different perspectives can often help us co-construct new understandings that will help us move forward in, in useful ways. So if it's the teacher or the grandparents or the friend or whoever it is, they're part of the problem organizing system, whoever's talking about the problem. The problem dissolving system means refers to that the problem the problem dissolving system is the system to the therapy system to dissolves having trouble with that word right now um when there's no longer a problem being defined so you know therapy's done when no one sees a problem anymore and that's kind of how they described it um very much focused on the social constructionist understanding. And so for case conceptualization, you're not trying to get a single definition necessarily of the problem. In fact, you almost want to avoid that. Collaborative therapists very much want to have multiple contradictory definitions and views and perspectives of the problem without biasing or privileging any of them, just letting them kind of float in the room with each one having its own space. What happens is with the dissonance in there, People be and with no since there's not a dueling monologues going on, which one's right? We're allowing them all to kind of sit there, and it's almost like the ideas just kind of percolate and bounce around the room. And because no one's kind of, for lack of a better term, this is not a postmodern term, but I, I think my students often find this helpful. No one's feeling defensive, so they're taking in all these ideas. Ideas finally, it begins to help them reshape and reunderstand their own position. And a good way to think about this um, process is that. Even if, for example, you don't change a person's perspective, because all these ideas were floating in the room, the story they're telling themselves about what the problem is and is not has shifted. And that's significant. It's that shift in their worldview, their definition, what they're telling themselves, the stories they're telling themselves what the problem is, is going to shift the possibilities they see 
um, for how to resolve things. So what you're really assessing for first and foremost is the, I think of it as the internal logic or glue that makes up the client's world, their hopes, their dreams, their understanding of the problems, the problem, the potential solutions, what are the symptoms. So you want to have, get a very, very detailed understanding of the logic that holds, that's making the client's world make sense. So now we're going to talk briefly about uh, targeting change and goal setting in collaborative therapy. So in, in terms of setting goals in collaborative therapy, the overall overarching goal is to create a sense of agency within the client. And what this means is we want the client to feel like they can make decisions in their own life, make changes, uh, create the life that they want. They can affect their life and direct their life and where they want to go. And there's, so there's that sense of being competent and being able to take meaningful action in their lives. Um, Harleen often talks about this sense of transformation. So it's not that we change people so much, but there's some of the, you know, the old that remains and we transform it, reshape it. We add more uh, nuances or layers to it rather than like getting rid of the problem, solving it and having something new. Um, and so there's this, um, there's more of this sense of transformation rather and, ch um, and shift rather than changing or fixing what is there. And it's really more about uh, creating new possibilities for meaning and relationship. So, you know, once a client feels like they know how to affect, create their life and move it in the direction they want to, therapy can, you know, is over in, in, in most cases, unless the client, unless the therapist in her dialogue says, no, 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 you, you know, I don't think you're ready to discharge. But in most cases, once they have that sense of I can affect the change I want to have in my life, then that's kind of like you, you've achieved the end goal. But any specific goals are always co-constructed, co collaboratively identified with clients and put into um, using everyday client language to define what that goal is. You know, like, you know, I want to be able to, um, you know, share my emotions more with my partner or whatever it might be. So let's talk a little bit more about the doings or interventions or and certainly intervention is not a term that a collaborative therapist would use. Um, they think of it more of just ways of promoting change and ways of promoting uh, more effective dialogical conversations. So in many ways, the primary intervention, so to speak, is what would be called conversational questions. And these are questions that kind of arise naturally from within the dialogue rather than a professional theory. So even though there are many similarities um, between um, narrative therapy and collaborative therapy, I think one of the most striking differences is that a narrative therapists have lots of kind of predefined sets of questions to help therapists, you know, um, shift meaning. But in collaborative therapy, it comes, there are, there's like, there are none, I think. I, well, there are hardly any, because the idea is the questions come from within the conversation. So as the client begins to describe their world, there are these conversational questions that come out where you're assuming nothing. So when the client says, you know, my, my, you know, husband had an affair. And so that might be the statement. And so you want to, don't, you don't want to fill in any of those blanks. So you want to be very curious about that. So, you know, what are your, how, how, what was your response to learning that he had that affair? And, you know, and so you want, you don't assume the person was devastated. You may, they may be angry. They may be sad. They may be everything. Um, and so you, you don't fill in those blanks, whatever, whatever the problem might be. And so you keep listening to for the, how they make the meaning. So, for example, if there was an affair and the woman's devastated, she says, oh, my God, I, um, I don't, you know, I, I can't believe he must not really love me. And so you would do this very, you know, gently, but you, you know, and maybe not in the first session. But the question then becomes, so, how, so your, your husband had an affair and I'm curious how is it that his decision, you know, to do what he did makes you feel like he, he never loved you or that you're not lovable or that you did something wrong? Where does, where does that idea come from? And 
if you have of course the right relationship needs to be you know developed and then she can also then you get this kind of mutual puzzling which we'll get to where she's like well you know she's in her world of course he doesn't love me or it's of course you know something must I mean, must not be good enough of course it's just this lot and so but where did she get that idea because it's actually an interpretation and so you just become very intensely curious with them and asking these questions that come from within the conversation and if you don't assume anything you're looking for the logic of the interpretation and even if it's a very standard interpretation like you you know, I'm hurt that my husband had an affair. That is socially the normal, you know, interpretation of such a response. And, and so even if it's standard within our culture, but where does she, what meaning does she make of it? And where did she get that idea? And, you know, and you begin to explore these. And as you look for the source of these um, ideas, oftentimes clients aren't even fully aware of it themselves. And that's where the new meaning begins to get generated. So perhaps one of the most useful ideas in all of psychotherapy and is this um, idea of appropriately unusual comments. And this really comes from Tom Anderson's uh, Reflecting Teamwork. And he identified uh, three types of comments. One is comments that are too usual. And so this is where you may be reflecting or summarizing what a client's saying, but there's no real added meaning. The other, there's another type of comment that's too unusual and you're coming way too much from the therapist's perspective and the client is not able to like integrate it or I think digest whatever the, the um, idea is. It may just may be too strange. You may even be creating a monologue where your therapist's idea about what needs to happen or how it should be defined is um, shutting down the client. Um, but too, if, so if uh, comments are too unusual, that's also a problem. And so you kind of want like this um, Goldilocks principle of like appropriately unusual. And so what you want is a comment that is similar enough to the client's worldview that they can digest it, make sense of it, work with it. Um, but it's different enough so that they create some, a new, some new meaning. And there needs to be these appropriately unusual um, comments that enable the client to generate new meaning, either too usual or too unusual. Um, or neither one the client can use to generate new meanings. I think this is very important oh, no matter what approach you work from and I often think of teenagers and initially with most teenagers anything that's too different from their reality that's coming from an adult um, is too unusual. But it's funny what I love with teenagers once they realize you're not one of them one of those adults and that they can actually talk with you and you're going to actually listen to them and be curious and understand their worldview then you can say almost anything. Um, but yes, you know, so that appropriately and what's too usual or too unusual really depends on the client and your relationship and the level of trust and rapport between the two of you. Um, and so how far, how different to be, it really does depend. And one of the things I think about is when I'm working with clients, I, I talk about the pause, which is where you ask the client a question. Like, where, you know, where does the idea that his having an affair means you're, you're not good enough or you did something wrong? Where does that idea come from? You get what I call the pause, where they're like, uh huh, I don't even know where that idea came from. Why do I, why do I think that? You know, where did that? And so they have this pause. And often they'll, and during the, they'll start by saying, well, I don't know. And rather than letting them get away with that, and, you know, and not get away is the wrong term. So they don't know. This is perfect. So now we're getting into new meaning and them understanding where their ideas are coming from. So I don't know. We leave some time and for pausing and we explore and we get more curious about where might it have come from and what's your best guess to is where it could have come from. Um, do you think it's, you know, whatever came from your family or from the social media or the media? Um, in general, and you just become very curious, and they then often join you in that curiosity. So there is this process, and I've alluded to it a couple times already, called mutual puzzling, and this is where uh, you, you you know you start by asking clients, and then they answer the questions because they kind of know the answer, and you keep going, you keep going. There's this point though where it begins to shift where the client's like, got to think about it too. They're not quite sure where they got that idea or made that assumption or whereas, you know, um, they become, so that you shift into this process of mutual puzzling. And this is a very two-way process of meaning making. And so you kind of are like trying out, kicking around new ideas. Um, I'm very curious and, and th this, you know, requires a lot of rapport and trust on the client's part. 
where they know that you're putting out ideas and we're, we're just exploring, we're, we're trying to understand, we're trying to, you know. And so, um, for example, in an in a interview I recently, or a session I recently had, I mean, we went from exploring the mother's understanding of why her daughter is dating this loser in her perspective, um, you know, to, for her blaming herself. And then we looked at her um, intergenerational patterns, you know, and we looked at you know, lots of different things. And, and so, what, no, no, I didn't say, oh, clearly this is an, you know, we got three ge generations replicating the same pattern. I didn't get stuck on that, you know, I didn't get stuck on the substance use issues that were kind of, you know, on the periphery here. We just kept exploring all the different possibilities um, that might make sense. And so but it was a very, it's a very two way exploration of what's going on. And that's where the new, that's where the co-creation of meaning happens. That's where the clients begin to understand themselves differently so that um, they can make different decisions and choices in their life. So another um, important idea that comes out of collaborative therapy is the idea of being public. Um, and this is where the therapist shares their inner dialogue. And this is typically only done when it's um, the therapist's inner dialogue is so intense that they, it's making it difficult to relate. Um, like the extreme examples, you know, people sometimes say, well, you know, if a client you know, believes in domestic violence, you know, there are times when you should be able to hit your partner or child or whatever it is. You know, does the therapist ever speak up? Do they stay there and be quiet? And of course not. Um, the, collaborative therapists still follow the rules and the legal mandates of what therapists need to be doing. And obviously, if something's going on that is ethically feels very wrong to the therapist, um, that is, you know, could be brought up such as, you know, um, um, someone who kind of advocates violence um, or does not want to be challenged on that or doesn't want to look or explore that. Um, and so the therapist very does not privilege their perspective, um, but they put it out there on a par typically with the clients, unless there's legal, eth major legal ethical mandates that need to be dealt with. Um, as you know, and sometimes it's just used as a reflection for how the client might view or see something um, that's going on in the client's life that, that might be useful, hopefully, with the intention of being useful for the client to generate new meanings. Um, but so you will typically um, do this being public, one, when you have significant differences, maybe in values, goals, or purposes, but even more um, importantly is when communicating with external third parties. And actually most, um, most public agencies now actually embrace this piece of collaborative therapy and require, you know, clients to sign the treatment plans and such. Um, but the idea here is if you're going to have a conversation with a professional about your client, you know, whatever you're saying to that person, you should be able to say to the client rather than having these kind of therapeutic secrets going back and forth. Um, the therapist, and, and so if it's a report and you're saying that I don't think this mother's ready to take her kids back, you're going to talk to the client about that, not let them be blindsided, you know, when they go to court. Um, talk about that. You're very clear as to, you know, um, this is what the social worker says you need to do. I'm going to do everything I can to help you, you know, achieve those goals, but I will not lie or cheat for you. And, you know, I'm going to write a letter up. And so you write the letter up and you let them know what's going on. And you're open about that. You don't have these kind of secret conversations, um, just as a matter of respect. So Peggy Penn in particular is known for uh, using writing and letter writing to access multiple voices. And so clients can be asked, and so this idea, again, again, you know, we're talking about collaborative therapy, one of the main things is that multiple contradictory voices in the room. And so you can often do this through letter writing or writing various forms. So the clients might be asked to um, write a, a letter to themselves from various aspects of, you know, their newly emerging selves, future selves, past selves. I do this type of work a lot with um, people who've experienced childhood abuse to write to that child in the past who's been abused or even from the wise you know old older woman or man who's writing to that person now or the person the child in the past these various letters begin to create new meaning um, you can also have them write letters uh, to themselves from significant others who are either alive in the past or in the future um, again this can be very healing um, after a loss or after abuse. Um, so letters to and from significant others who are alive or dead from a voice or a perspective that was formerly kept private from them in their lives. 
Um, also letters or journals um, where they speak from different parts of themselves that are not typically expressed or that are new parts of themselves that are emerging in theories uh, in therapy that they can kind of explore with these different parts. And obviously there's an infinite possibility. And again, this is done when the clients are interested and they, you know, it, it seems to make sense for them. Um, it can be very, very powerful. And obviously if a client's not interested, the therapist is not going to try to, you know, convince them to do so. So now we're going to talk about reflecting teams. So reflecting teams um, emerge from um, Tom Anderson's uh, work uh, with the Milan team. And as I think I mentioned, Tom had uh, gone down and studied in Milan. And the setup physically in those days was the family would be in one room. There's a one-way mirror. The team would be behind it, physically behind the one-way mirror. And, and they would... The, um, the therapist would come out, talk to the team, and go back. Well, if you've ever worked behind a one-way mirror, you know that there's a possibility of flipping the lights on what would have been the client side, and on where the team is, and turn off the lights where the family is, and that you can actually do that in reverse. And so Tom Anderson, who was very much affected um, by social constructions ideas when they were coming out, had the idea to actually just switch the lights. And so... Um, that's how reflecting team practices began and the idea was to have these team conversations in front of the clients and one of the if you've ever done this or practiced or seen this in action you know one of the things it really does is help the therapists to involved the team the observer could be a supervisor involved to to be very mindful and respectful of the con of the uh, how they're describing to use uh, describe the family and it makes when you're doing this, it makes you very cognizant of how they might be making sense of how we speak. And you know whether or not um, you, you know, no one ever does this, or very few people do this on a regular basis. But I think one of the most important things that comes out of training uh, using reflecting teams is learning to be respectful the way you talk about clients. And it's a, I think it's a very profound ethical obligation we have. And so it's important. I mean, there are times in this work, you know, we can get a little punch, we can get a little silly, um, but it's important that fundamentally we have a deep, deep and profound respect for clients. And I think that's one of the things that Tom Anderson, um, his work uh, really stands out to me in this way. So this reflecting process, you know, evolved over the years, but in the form it most frequently takes is that you're, um, especially when you're working from a collaborative kind of uh, way that either Harleen or Tom Anderson worked, is that you want to develop diverse strands of conversation. And so there's, you know, it's not like the team comes to consensus, like you might, let's say, in, in a traditional systemic family therapy way, you, you might want to come to a hypothesis that we're all going to work from. This is almost the opposite idea of we're just laying out different perspectives. One of the easiest ways to do this is describe how each person is making sense of the situation because it's usually kind of different um, without necessarily trying to force the pieces to fit neatly together. Because you're trying to create a little bit of dissonance um, like appropriately unusual comments that uh, create some dissonance. It allows the client to make new meaning. It allows for the uh, meanings to shift for the client. And so that's why you're trying to avoid this kind of common agreement. You also obviously want to be very, very careful to avoid either evaluating or judging clients. And though definitely you'll see people complimenting clients. I think even that is, is a very, you need to be more careful with compliments and praise than you might think. Because when a therapist praises a particular course of action or perspective or way of viewing things, um, it kind of shuts down other possibilities. And so I think it's very important when we do praise to do it from within the client's value system because otherwise, even though it's very polite and nice and the clients may like it, you're still imposing the therapist's views and values onto the client. And, and so... The idea here is just to be offering these reflections um, and make sure that they're owned by the person speaking because you never <laughs> you never know when you're accidentally offending someone. You can be trying to be as thoughtful as is possible. But because we all may, have made meanings, we have different life experiences, different behaviors and actions, um, what may be very polite to one person can be very offensive to another.
And it's important with reflecting teams because you don't have a lot of context. You don't often have that much information to, to be tentative and to be cautious in how you put out ideas out there. So, so Tom Anderson has some basic guidelines um, for working as a reflecting team. And the first is to only use it with the client's permission. It's never something that should be kind of forced down a client's throat. Although I find if the therapist is um, able, is enthusiastic and hopeful and trusts the process, the clients typically do. And this is true whether it's gestalt reflecting chairs where you're talking to, you know, an empty chair or um, a reflecting team. Uh, an interesting thing that Tom does is he gives clients permission to listen or not listen. It's okay to tune out if you decide to. Um, the, uh, he does recommend that therapists actually comment only on what is seen and heard, not, not what is observed. And this goes against a lot of traditional uh, therapist training. But Tom really believed in client privacy. And he kind of felt like if a client's trying to hold back tears, don't poke. You know, if they're trying to hold back tears, respect it. Why, why are we poking at them? if they're not wanting to um, to show those tears to us. And so there was a profound respect for clients, some would say to a fault, um, but there was a profound respect um, and it's hard to be too respectful, I think. Um, it certainly gives you pause and something to reflect on um, when you're trying, when clients seem to be trying to hide something, whether or not we have the right to proceed just because we're a therapist. Um, as I've mentioned, this talking from a very questioning, speculative, tentative perspective. Um, it's very, very important. Um, and separate physically the team from the family. Nowadays, often the team will just come and sit in one corner of the room. Um, otherwise, you, you can have two physical different spaces is the other way to do it. And you can also have like a video camera. I see that in modern times, we have more video cameras on the family. And the team comes in just for the... Uh, reflection part, the five, 10 minute reflecting part, and then they leave for the rest of the session. Always are fine. And again, listening for what is appropriately unusual or how you can create something, uh, meanings that are appropriately unusual. And another quite way to start this, uh, the sessions uh, is to begin by asking, how would you like to use this session today? It's a question the family, the therapist asks to the family um, at the beginning of any session, but particularly one in which the team is there so that the team also has a sense of what the family or client is hoping for. So you'll also hear about the as-if reflecting process. This um, I is developed primarily, I believe, by Harleen, so I've come to know it at least. Um, and this is a supervision technique where the therapist actually has or the supervisor has each the, everyone in the supervision group listening at, from a particular point of view in the uh, system. So they listen as if you are the mother, the father, the child, the social worker, the teacher, the best friend, whatever it is. And so each member listens as if they're one of these people, and then they speak first person from this perspective. Oftentimes you will have somebody actually speak as if they are the therapist, and have the therapist will typically not take place in, uh, or not participate, but instead watch the reflecting process. And so this is really great uh, for staffing cases, especially complex cases or cases that aren't responding well to treatment um, or if a therapist is feeling stuck. It really can help them understand better where everyone's coming from. It's actually a very emotionally intense process when you do it typically. And now I want to um, briefly highlight some elements of the um, research and evidence base for collaborative therapy and reflecting teams. So, the, um, as you may expect, or maybe not, um, but there's definitely more qualitative research than quantitative research on collaborative therapy and reflecting teams. And so most of the focus is on the client's lived experience of therapy and its effect on their lives. And so, again, this is a, um, very con uh, consistent with their social constructionist philosophy. And there is, um, there, there is more research actually done in, in narrative therapy, uh, mostly coming out of Australia where it's widely used and the push to use obviously any approach nowadays um, in public mental health requires uh, you know, increasing research. And so that's where you'll actually find most of the quantitative research related to postmodern therapies. Um, interestingly enough, there's a fair amount of neurological research and interpersonal neurobiology that really supports um, not directly the outcomes of these, approach, uh, these approaches, but very much support um, 
the premise of these approaches. Uh, one is that neurologically, psychologically, our brains think in narrative, we think in stories. And that is the social construct constructionist metaphor primarily. I guess they also use text too. But this idea of story and narr narrating a person's identity that is where our identity comes from and that is how the brain actually processes information. We put everything into story timelines and actually trauma is when that, that process gets interrupted. So it's a very important process for the human brain to make sense of lived experience. And another interesting uh, kind of corollary is this idea of bottom-up versus top-down processing, and this refers to the different layers of the prefrontal cortex. So um, the top levels are very much about um, where you take your current categories for the universe and the world and experience, and you it processes downwards, and you just simply label what's the information coming in. That's called top-down processing, where you label what's coming in. We have to do this. Our brain, we would go crazy if we had to treat everything in a mindful way, it's like as if I've never experienced it before. You know, you won't be able to get up, get out of bed and get a cup of tea in the morning. Um, where bottom-up processing is, is actually very close to what mindfulness is, where you're taking in um, information as if you're seeing it for the first time, you're re-experiencing it, and allowing it to be recategorized as a very simple way of putting it. And so this bottom-up processing is, um, is very helpful in many, many ways, but it also is very useful when a person is feeling stuck because it brings in the new ideas. And often this top-down is like, you know, my husband's lazy, you know, my kid doesn't respect me, my, my boss is a jerk, whatever it is. And you have these stories, and no matter what the other person does, you have this story, and it's very hard. And research is very clear, it's very hard for us to change those um, labels we give to other people in our lives. And so this bottom-up processing allows us to reorganize, to shift those categories, to soften them, so that we can actually process what's coming in in a new way. And so finally, I want to wrap up by just uh, describing using these approaches, collaborative and uh, reflecting teams, with diverse populations. So collaborative therapy has been used widely um, in Europe, Latin America, and Asia. Interestingly enough, it's probably less widely used in the United States because it, it's a very philosophical approach and the U.S. tends to be a pretty pragmatic um, culture. Um, but one of the things that really makes it uh, useful for working cross-culturally and internationally is the concept of not knowing. And that's a non-assuming. And the whole process, the whole basic process, is trying to understand from within the client's lived perspective and understanding the logic and values and, that have the client making sense of the world the way they do. And it's a very respectful approach of the client's values. It doesn't judge them as good or bad, irrational, you know, work, you know, it, or not. It's this very gentle process where we explore it. Um, as we do that, go through that process, the client joins in becoming curious and puzzling, and mutual puzzling, mutual exploring. And so the client then makes re their meanings actually get, let's say, reinterpreted um, through the client's own process. The therapist isn't putting out new interpretations or new ways of looking at things. Um, it's the process that does it. And so, and there is this just incredible emphasis of respect for the client's worldview in a way that few other approaches do. Um, there have been uh, particular studies and interest in using collaborative with intercultural uh, couples. So when you think of intercultural cu couples, in most cases you're going to have you know, two different genders, two different cultures, two different personalities, two different family of origins. You know, that's a lot. That's a lot to integrate and try it all. A lot of differences that are going to be there and, and fundamental values that are, can often be different. And so it's hard enough um, when you've got a couple from the, within the same culture trying to make it work. But when you add that extra layer of cross-cultural differences, there's a lot more there. And this process of mutual exploring, being curious, being open, being respectful, that whole process um, that the therapist facilitates can also be used you know, with a couple between themselves. Um, and again, too, with working with um, either same-sex couples or couples with alternative sexual identities that um, or gender identities, that helping clients uh, make sense of uh, these differences, explore them in a very respectful way, and to be able to let, allow their, their meaning-making to lead you know, it's a very, this is a very respectful approach again, where that having the client feel respected and not judged is critical. 
and that can be a real um, issue in these uh, with um, clients with you know diversity. And so this approach is uh, one of the more ideal, along with uh, narrative therapy, one of the few that actually puts you know the concept of culture and diversity at the heart of the practice. So I'm going to leave you here with um, a few online resources for our collaborative therapy and reflecting teams. I hope you found this a useful introduction, and I wish you the best as you uh, continue your ex exploration of family therapy theories.